Yo, you will notice when watching or listening to this podcast that the audio quality is slightly below what you're normally used to from H Hour. Uh, basically, I recorded a new location, which is obvious if you're watching this on YouTube. I recorded a new location and I didn't do the test and I should have bought a podcast and I had multiple technical issues with the finished product. However, Gareth was able to assist with this following the podcast and uh, and a I'd like to give a big thank you to uh, Nigel and James from Molinaire who pulled out of the bag technical expertise and prowess. I say pulled out of the bag, pulled out of the bag for me. It's obviously, and they, they must have it every day, but they did a, a sterling job to get the podcast quality for this episode to where it is uh, now, which is night and day different to what it was i was not going to be able to release it in the state it was in the first place so thank you thank you to them both and uh enjoy the podcast can we can i get you on the podcast please and you said yes of which i'm very grateful and now we're here appreciate it uh, the pleasure's all mine absolutely you know i mean it's a, it's a great opportunity to catch up and a fairly informal environment and share a few tales yeah yeah i i think really why it's from my perspective, why it's come about, we were talking off air. I like to interview people I can learn from and I find really interesting. And since we first met, which was what, 2013, 2014 for the Kajaki production, yeah. of which we're an exec producer, yeah. um, my knowledge of the TV and film industry has come on a little bit more. Not mm. to a great extent, to a little bit more, to where I've done a little bit of extra work. That, I mean, that's it. But I've just got a little bit of an insight into it. And also, there's been a huge change since those Kajaki days, right? Mm -hmm. One of which has been streaming has come about and really taken hold. How has that changed the way TV and film is made and the way people consume it? Mm. So it's been, a, I mean, it's been an incredible evolution, really. I mean, if you were to plot it out on a graph and looked at the amount of hours viewed by the various audiences that are looking at filmed content, it's been growing exponentially year on year for, for the past sort of seven to eight years now. And the, the streamers are at the very vanguard of that evolution. Um, given the nature of how they put content into the world, where it's in a non-linear form and pretty much their audience expects it all to be available and in an instant, the just weight of production that has been uh, made uh, across the last sort of seven or eight years has been phenomenal. And then when you layer that against the fact that, you know, during the pandemic, most people were stuck at home, they were consuming content at a great rate of knots. Not only has there been this, this boom in production, but there's also been this boom in consumption. And this is why we are now seeing um, just so much film and TV being made in the world. And if we just look at the UK, because obviously my specialism is, is what's going on here in the UK. If we just look at, at the UK, there's some recent forecasting done by Screen Skills, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And that in a fairly conservative growth curve over the course of the next three to five years, and looking at the amount of stage space that's coming on stream in the UK, looking at the amount of commissioned hours that are being made out of the UK, we're likely to move from somewhere around £5.2 billion worth of production spend in scripted, and by scripted I mean TV drama and feature films. And that will grow to its forecast somewhere near £7.3 to £7.4 billion within the next three years. So we're on this sort of production boom at the moment that doesn't seem like it's going to abate anytime soon. Um, it's great for the British economy, it's great for those that are working in the industry, but it is surfacing the fact that we need more resource, we need more people to be working in, the, in, in our industry. Um, and that's, you know, that is creating opportunity now that maybe wasn't there as recently as four or five years ago. So I think the, the, the big important effect that the streamers have had is this high um, this high consumption rate and an expectation that the content is there ready to be consumed in an instant. You know, 10 years ago, who knew what, who knew what binge watching was? Binge watching back in my day was waiting for, um, you know, the DVD box set to be issued and suddenly you could sit down with three discs. You know, it's not sitting in front of a set top box and being able to consume 36 hours of a, an American show. So I think it's, it's, it, it's evolved and it's changed. There's obviously 
now new players coming into the streaming market. Um, you may have seen recently that you know, the arrival of Paramount Plus, Disney Plus is fairly new to the game. There are a number of really interesting mergers that are taking place. So you may have seen that Warner Brothers, HBO and Discovery have recently joined forces and their streaming service will, will unite those. So yeah, high, high consumption, high user base, uh, a very strong appetite for, for content to be created. And thankfully, you know, the commissioners, the international commissioners are looking very favourably on the on the UK. There's a number of reasons why we still remain outside of Hollywood, one of the biggest production bases in the in the world. Yeah. So on the on on the that growth you spoke about from what was it, two point three to five point two? So just just re, just in recent years, so five point three to seven point four billion. 7 .4. Yeah. So two and a bit billion in the forecast in the next three years as growth. So, so the major things that are driving the growth, is it that one, people are spending more time, so an individual is on, on average is spending more time watching TV or film, uh, or yeah, and then the second one, is it that, no, that's it, are spending, so, people so, spending more time doing yeah, it, for, uh, for, and more people are more interested in doing it. Because yeah. if you think back to the good old days, mm. like the only thing my mum would watch, for example, mm. would be Coronation Street, Maybe Emmerdale, like series-wise, Emmerdale and a and other, you know, like Lovejoy or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's my question. Are people spending more time watching I think they, I think they are. I mean, there is, um, there's fierce competition for eyeballs at the, at the moment. And, you know, <clears throat> we have made the ability to watch filmed content in a better environment at home easier. You know, the times that your mum was sitting down to watching Coronation Street was probably on a four by three TV that's, you know, no more than a foot across at the end of the lounge. You know, these days people have got 58 inch TVs with full Dolby Atmos. We've, we've brought the theatrical experience into the home and I think that's an important thing. Um, you know, part of the competition for eyeballs is the emergence of the games community. So that's very prevalent in terms of, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to limit that to just saying that that's the younger generation. You know, there's a lot of older gamers as well. But I think it is, it's people watching more content and investing more time in longer running shows. You know, I mean, if you look at something like Game of Thrones, which the worldwide audience numbered in the billions and, you know, that ran over, I think it was more than 10 seasons and each season that's had multiple episodes. So you were talking about hundreds of hours of programming and people are prepared to commit that to, to a series that they are engaged by with characters that they want to know more about, with stories that, you know, they want to, to see and hear. Um, and that I, th that I think is, is, is the biggest threat to this growth curve is that, you know, how are we going to keep on providing so many new stories with great characters in interesting locations without it becoming too industrialized where we're just trying to make sort of replicants of stuff that's worked before. Um, but yeah, so people consuming a, a, a lot more content is the, is the big driver uh, in this. And I know that, you know, other cultural pursuits have suffered from that, you know, attendances in sporting events is slightly down, you know, people going to the theatre maybe is not as, uh, as common these days, people going to concerts, you know. Um, it always amuses me when you sort of see, you know, a modern concert now and someone that's paid the money and travelled to an arena to go and see their musical idol have got their iPhone stuck in front of their face and they're recording it rather than being more in the moment. But that makes me sound like a curmudgeon, which is not. So I think, yeah, you know, tastes have changed, audiences have grown, um, the ability to connect to audiences now um, and market. I mean, that's another big big thing is, you know, it's not that these audiences were suddenly sat at home and ping, there was Netflix or Disney Plus and suddenly everyone was watching stuff. You know, the emergence of social media alongside the proliferation of content, I think is quite interconnected. You know, we now know that there are more shows that are out there because the marketing of them mm -hmm. has become really quite a science, you know. Um, so I think there's the, the sort of other influences that, that are in there. On the on the streaming and tech side, the the, imp the impact of the ch on the changes, I know that. So one of the obvious ways where it sort of changed the way producers put stuff out is on the on the do they drop a series on a weekly basis or another f duration basis, or do they drop it all together and some do it, some don't? It's interesting. But what about in the forecasting or anything else you've seen or experienced people's attention span? Ha um, is that impacting the the, the length of the length of productions, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think it does in terms of 
what we refer to as multi-episodic content. So stuff that's a series, and that might be a limited series like SAS Rogue Heroes, for example, that's six, six fifty-four minutes over the course of a series. But you know that whole show was finished, delivered, and ready. So if you wanted to watch every episode back to back, you could do that. You know, it wasn't the case of every Sunday night at nine o'clock you could only ever watch those. Um, but just a, a small point of correction. I mean, it's it's rarely the producer that will get to dictate the exploitation of what they've created. Um, you know, it's quite it's quite interesting. You know, when people ask me, well, what does a producer do? The the, the best anecdote I, I found works, particularly with people that you know. Not just talking about talking to school children, but people that you know, are business people, and know how the world works. The, the easiest comparison is like a property developer. So a property developer will look at a parcel of land and will know what the purchase price is. That property developer will know that they have options to either put a hospital on there, a factory on there, fifty houses, or one distribution centre. So the property developer will make that conscious decision. Right. Okay. Now if I put 50 houses on there, I know to make those 50 houses, it's going to cost me X. I'm going to need a number of trades to facilitate the building of it. It's going to take a schedule of works to pull all that together and make sure that it happens on time and on budget. But at the end, I've got to have a fair assessment as a property developer, what the market value is likely to be of that development. And that's what I'm doing as a producer, but my property is intellectual property. So I look at a script and the script will suggest whether it's a single feature film, a la Kajaki, a multi-episodic TV series of limited form, such as SAS Rogue Heroes, or maybe it's a long-running serial, you know, going back to your dear mum's Coronation Street. And in that assessment, in all of those permutations, I'm running cost calculations against what I think it will cost. OK, if I do it as a limited series and it's six hours of programming, it's going to be this. If I do it as a one off feature film, it's going to be two hours of content and it's going to cost this. If it's long running, open ended series, then that's a whole different set of calculations. But what I'm trying to marry up is my estimation of what the market's going to pay for that content and what the content is going to cost to produce. Because if there's a massive disconnect there, I'm either going to be unable to get it financed or I'm going to be left with a very expensive mess at the, at the end of it. So it's that sort of, so typically through the negotiating with the financiers, that's when you establish the exploitation means. You know, so, you know, the BBC will say, OK, we really like this content, but we see it as six one hours or we really like this content. We see it as, as 12, 30 minutes or 12 one hours. From, I mean, interest on the, on, the, on the finance side, so I had some experience doing filming during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of the things that amazed me was, one, how, how rigid the production I was on were with the COVID rules, for example, understandably so. And it's also sort of made me understand why Tom Cruise is that big rant of his, that we went viral, I thought, but I sort of understood, oh, okay, that's where he's coming from, because he always the jobs if you don't listen and mm. wear your mask, for example. Um, but it also highlighted to me the immense cost mm. just to make just to make uh, one episode of whatever of what, whatever it is. Um, was it more difficult? Did it become more difficult to finance productions during the pandemic? So the, the pandemic brought about sort of three phases, really. Um, one was the first lockdown and all production stopped in the UK. The only thing that was still shooting was radio because that was limited to being single operators, news because they were able to quite quickly sort of contain the, the news studio environment. Um, but most scripted production stopped for a period of time. And as an industry, we recognised that that couldn't last. You know, there were, there's too many people whose jobs are dependent on working. Most of the, something like 65% of the film and TV workforce are freelance. So if they're not working, they're not earning. It's the same as being a taxi driver or a delivery <coughs> driver. You know, if you're not working, you're not earning. Um, and that first phase really put a shot across the bow of the industry. And that second phase, um, which was pretty incredible, I, I was quite close to the process on this. So a number of a number of organisations with interests aligned got together quite quickly. So Screen Skills, who I, I, was, I am and was working with at the time, the British Film Institute. Institute, the British Film Commission, the Producers Alliance for Cinema and TV, everyone realised we've got to find a way of getting back in. 
and so quickly moved to working with NHS England, working with health specialists, started to rationalise and break down the process of filmmaking and looking at all of those um, potential moments at which you could see transmission of the, of, of, of the disease. And we wrote the protocols were written within four and a half weeks. They were tested, they were ratified by NHS England. They were shared with all of the different production studios. Everyone sort of had a version that they were slightly working to because we had to protect the need for some discretion. But I remember being on the first test shoot uh, at the National Film and Television School where we were trying to work within the COVID protocols and we had to almost unpick the way we'd been working for 100 years. We've been making movies 110 years, you know, and we suddenly had to go in about it in a very, very different way. And being close to how that then managed to manifest itself and you got to a point where, for example, I went up onto, onto uh, the lot up at Leavesden, Leavesden's the big site that Warner Brothers, and even at the height of the pandemic, Warner Brothers had three TV shows and four movies filming. Everyone was in def different sort of walk streams, there was decam, decontamination spaces, there was, you know, there was on-site testing, everyone had to test before going in. Um, and so the sort of the shoot side of things uh, was, was managed really effectively. The thing that was was dislocating and very different was the amount of remote working that suddenly had to take place. It, it's very typical on the film production, you you try and build everything around the, the set, you know, you, you take on a studio space, you take a corridor of offices, you know that the art department are in that room, the director's in that room, costumes down in the basement, the makeup trailers are pulled out to the back of the door, so you try and keep everything close, where suddenly you now had different departments working independently, quarantine spaces where people weren't allowed to cross those boundaries, you know, very few people. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that was established was this notion of protective bubbles around the cast. So, you know, typically a cast member would have a makeup artist doing their touch-ups, costume artist tweaking their costume, an AD telling them where to go and what to do, a driver picking them up and dropping them off, the director giving them instruction on the day, the camera team advising them where to stand to get the right light on them. And that suddenly had to shift. It had to be just a single point of contact. So I think it was quite disconcerting for the cast. And they were the, they were the ones that we really had to, you know, throw the cotton wool around and create that sort of protective bubble. But what was incredible was that this, this, this industry, which, you know, quite often is in commercial opposition with each other and fairly sharp elbowed over finding crew, finding locations, finding equipment, were really collegiate and recognised that if we didn't actually all pull together with this, then it could actually mean the cessation of filming until the pandemic was over, which was something that we just didn't want to happen. So an incredible, you know, incredible time of film history to be part of, really. Mm. It's one of the, it's it's uh, one of the things that surprised me. Where on the particular production I worked on was, I fully expected. So I had an inkling that they were well. I had an inkling how rigid it was going to be, but I think you always where some where there's lots of rules and regulations and red tape and and what can be perceived perceived sometimes as, as bureaucracy. You think, hmm, behind the scenes, there's no way they're following this. Mm. There's no way they're following these protocols. Yeah. And, uh, and there was loads of stuff I had to do before, before, before a scene, or you know the score. Yeah. I, I used to have, have to have a, a, a test, go and get a COVID test the day before a costume fitting. Mm -hmm. Costume fitting done, and after that costume fitting, another COVID test, because the next day I was having a haircut. Mm. And then get a haircut, and again, COVID test, because the next day I'm shooting, if it happened that way. And I remember when I first stepped on onto set, and everyone was following the rules. Mm -hmm. Even in, you know, even in like the green room, there's just a handful of people and you could get away with murder if you wanted to. You couldn't get away with murder yeah. because everyone had the kit on. Because I, I think it was so, so important to keep the industry going. Yeah. Like you said, you know, it's uh, people's livelihoods. I hadn't realised that, that that percentage of the workforce were... Um, Freelance. Freelancers. Yeah. Were freelancers. You know. I think the, the, the fragility of it was was what kept everyone in, in, in set. People realised that, you know, you didn't have to get it much wrong for it to really go very, very wrong. I mean, you know, I, I would never, you know, we've we've shared stories, haven't we, about sort of, you know, the, the, the similarities between the, the sort of military life and the film life and, you know, very, very different levels of jeopardy for sure. But, you know, we knew that as a, as, as a unit, you know, and, you know, that that is the collection of the cast and crew, the short 
form descriptor is we are a unit, so in the same way that you have military unit, we realised that we had to be there for each other. And, you know, one person's flippancy or failure to sort of pay attention to good hand hygiene or whatever could knock out a day's filming and that would be an incredible loss for everyone. So I think there was um, there was a sort of almost like blitz spirit, I suppose, really. You know, it's a case of sort of pulling together. But there were, you know, there were instances of outbreaks, you know, happening, you know, there were, one of the Batman movies went into two weeks lockdown because um, the lead got ill, and you know, the, the the more more acute issues were around where you had projects that had, you know, uh, very limited cast, very li very difficult to cross schedule. You know, if you lose a particular actor on a particular film and they're in nearly every scene, then that makes it very difficult to go and shoot anything else. You know, yeah. What happens uh, in that situation? Well, so what will typically happen is if someone or, uh, I mean, whether it's an actor, whether it's a location, whether it's a bit of equipment going down. You know, you know when you, you talk know. about millions, you know, yeah. there's money at stake. In the, yeah. You know, you're yeah. halfway through a production, someone has gone off the production for whatever reason. It's the, yeah. yeah. So what, what, what happened um, in the UK, we were quite fortunate. We had a thing called the Production Restart Scheme. So if the film was properly insured if they were following all of the right protocols if they had taken every measure that they could to remain safe and through unforeseen circumstances the filming was paused there was a there's basically a government backed insurance bond in place to cover the um, the cost of abandonment um, so that that was what we were working with during the pandemic but outside of the pandemic typically what happens is you know you do have insurances in place um you are expected as a production company to make best efforts to try and recover any lost time or find an alternate solution i mean for example something i was on set with um just three months ago we were working with a hydraulic platform that this plane was sitting on and for two and a half hours it seized on the, you know in the morning and we we were there was nothing else we could shoot we couldn't shoot around it we couldn't do anything to it and we had to sort of just bide our time and i knew that i could have had everyone running around like headless chickens and trying to but there wasn't anything to do it was just this component part wasn't working um and you either find a solution or you weather the storm you know and on that day the solution was found we shot slightly fewer uh, angles i managed to get the unit to speed up a little bit and we sort of made our day um, but it's normally the production team would have to find a way of of making it work mm. one of the things i realized when um when you were talking just now about the, the some of the similarities because you and i bags were talking before and about the similarities between tv uh, the, the yeah, film industry and and military <coughs> of which there are 100 percent there are similarities and one of the main ones i think is that in both worlds, 99.9% .9 of the things you do in the day are time sensitive, mm -hmm. R regardless of where, the, where you are in the machine that is producing something or trying to achieve a mission or training or whatever in the military side, it's time sensitive. Mm -hmm. It's always time sensitive, mm -hmm. which brings in an element of, can bring an element of chaos and unpredictability, but also really rewards fast thinking, thinking outside the box, unusual solutions to what are often common problems, but with, you know, a limited set of resources or completely different resources. You have to be solution orientated in, in, the, in, in, in the film game particularly, and, you know, finding workarounds, finding solutions. But, you know, a lot of, and same, same as in the military life, I, one would hope, you know, a lot of it comes down to good pre-planning, you know, and there's an old adage that I was taught by an assistant director that I worked for, and he refers to the seven Ps, which are perfect pre-production prevents piss poor photography. And you sort of go, <laughs> okay, right, that makes sense. You know, what are the things that I can make sure I'm not going to get wrong on the day because I thought it through, I've had the difficult conversations, I've rationalised what I need to do. And I always encourage that in producers that I'm training up because by doing the simple things well and effectively, you're creating more space to be able to be expansive on the creative side of things, you know. And so you're, you're trying to sort of be as prepared as you can, but things will always, you know, there'll always be curveballs. There'll always be someone goes sick or suddenly the weather changes from what was expected or, you know, there's innumerable things that can, excuse me, can, can get in the way, but you have to try and pre-plan as, as best you as best you can. And then once you, once you hit the ground, then it's about getting that end result, you know, getting that shot 
getting that scene. Um, yeah. How did you end up where you are now? Where did your career start? Like, where's the genesis of it? So, I, so basically, the, the the sort of start of my personal journey. Everyone's on a journey these days, isn't they? You know, I just remember when we used to be able to tell a story. Um, but no, so I mean, I I I, I always had a passion around uh, storytelling. Um, where I played my rugby, a uh, number of the guys that played had an association with the film industry. Um, but I remember being in a, in a cinema in Slough with my sister, watching E.T., which is the Steven Spielberg story. And for the first time in my life, I saw and heard my dad crying. And my dad's this big, roughy tufty rugby player. He's a fair bit taller than me, fair bit wider than me, but he was so moved by the scene that he was watching that it, it brought him to tears. I mean, admittedly, I brought him to tears in other ways in my later <laughs> teen, teen years. But there was something about the power of storytelling. And I then, um, you know, I, I, I shared with my careers teacher at the time that I'd, I'd sort of managed to secure this Saturday job at Pinewood. I was basically sweeping the floors and emptying the bins. Um, but I had an ambition to work in, in film. And I remember she deadpanned and just looked at me and just said, you're too thick. That's when teachers could use phrases like that. Um, you know, I was not academically bright enough to consider a, a career in film, um, but didn't listen to her. <laughs> um, and many years later, it was the same teacher that invited me back with my Oscar uh, to do the prize giving and stuff. So um, in terms of the actual, when did the, the, the sort of the real career get going? So I, I, I was, I was a challenging young man at school. I um, flirted with the idea of going into the armed forces. I was really into my sport, so played county level rugby, um, played a bit of ice hockey for Slough. But the, the the sort of education bit never really worked for me. You know, I was fine if I was working with my hands or doing things, but academic learning wasn't really for me. And it was a chance encounter. I, I was going to. My parents were moving down to Dorset and I was going to stay on living in Berkshire. I had a job in a sports shop. I was getting paid the princely sum of 25 quid to play for Slough Jets, the ice hockey team. And I thought my, you know, my path was possibly professional sport, but took my sister down to her A-level interviews at Weymouth College. And whilst I was there, sat in the car waiting for her, there was a bunch of students running around with a camera and a boom mic and a sun reflector and stuff. So thought that looked quite fun and got talking to them and through chatting to the students who then introduced me to the course leader and I've got to say I probably owe Paul Catis from Weymouth College uh, uh, a big part of my my latest successes because you know he saw in me someone that was driven by storytelling that hadn't necessarily had the academic breaks previously and he offered me a place offered me a place on a BTEC national diploma and my sister and I drove back from Weymouth working out how on earth we we're going to persuade mum and dad to agree to let me move down there with them because I hadn't been the easiest to live with. Um, but I committed that to them that I'd work really, really hard. And I did. I did. I, I sort of came out with straight distinctions, got into a film school in London, and it sort of set me back on back on the rails a little bit. And once arriving in London at Ravensbourne, really committed to the course, worked incredibly hard, and on graduation you know, started to work from from being a runner, which is the sort of dog's body of the industry, up to where I find myself now. Yeah, I remember, I remember you mentioning Ravensbourne now a while back when we first met, I think. <clears throat> um, is there an equivalent in any other industry to what a runner does? I, I think in most industries there will be some form of entry role where the expectation is it's about attitude and aptitude rather than the specifics of what you're being told to do you know go into most hairdressing salons which i've not done in probably <laughs> the last 40 years sorry we're a podcast you don't know that I'm, I'm bald um you know you go you go into a hairdressers and they will have the, the the saturday kid that's sweeping up the hair and making the cups of tea and coffee for the for the clients you know you go out onto a building site and there'll be the person that's doing the cleaning up the fetching and the carrying you know then they're, they're probably not the person laying the bricks and laying the tiles or putting the electrics in so i think in mo in most trade in most industries you do have that entry, le that entry level. Um, 
I don't think it's it, I don't think it, it has the same level of expectation or possibly the length of service. You know, I mean, mo most runners will probably be three to five years in that role before they start moving up into the the more senior roles within a department. But what's it like in the military? That I mean, you but you all go through a common range of training. Well, and you this start is different. Sort of oh, well, this is slightly different. I think is. I was going to say there with the runner. So just from my limited experience in the, in the in your industry, a runner will bounce from production company to production company to production to production. Yeah. So it must be very difficult. Or, or, no, not difficult. It must be highly competitive mm. to to work up to the next level in whatever you know branch you want to take in, in the industry. Whereas from the military perspective, and it does vary within the military as well. But for me. You know, I was part of Reg and, and um, we pretty much, I was in, in that unit for my entire time. Yeah. So I wasn't, you, and you tend to bounce from un, like subunit to subunit, right. department to department, if you like, yeah. upon promotion. Right. So you're in, you prove your worth, you get promoted, you move on. Yeah. Or you move for a career reason, you get a post into a training establishment, for right. example. Gotcha. So, yeah, it must be more challenging. Yeah. It, it? And it is, I mean, the, the, the one of the big, Big issues around our industry is that you know there are a lot of people that want to join our industry there is limited opportunity in terms of the amount of jobs that are there and even though you know i was mentioning some facts and figures earlier you know that growth curve alongside it has a projected growth of the workforce of um you know needing to to increase a further 15 to 25,000 bodies, people. Just in the UK? Ju just in the UK. You know, we have a standing work, it's, it's understood that the standing workforce in scripted, and again, that's limited to feature films and drama and basically productions that are made from a script rather than a documentary or other. You know, there's a, sta there's a standing workforce of somewhere between 215 and 240,000 individuals. And we think we need probably about another 10% again to keep pace with the amount of productions and stuff. But even still, if we grow the workforce to 300,000, that pales in comparison to a number of other industries. So, you know, the problem that we've got is that there are fewer places for people to go into. Um, but it's very, very popular. You know, um, we've, at Screen Skills, we're, we're currently running our, our intake for the next year of train e finder so we have an initiative where we find train retain uh, up to 300 individuals for their first year of work in the industry where we onboard them we introduce them to productions we run workshops so they can understand you know really fun stuff like their tax position you know but all the important stuff um, and each one of those places will have something like 20 applicants to each place that's awarded you know, so it's competitive. It's a competitive. Yeah, place. so supply is there. Mm. Um, what about so going back onto, onto the runner example as as, mm. as an entry level job? What about um, if someone's looking at a second career, mm -hmm. or they're not someone who's fresh out of uni or even in uni, you know, and they're looking to go into it? Do, is it is age an issue, or no, would it be a different? No, no I think that the, so. We, we refer to them as transferers, you know, and for example, at Screen Skills, we did a particularly effective piece of work working with ex-military. Um, it had struck me working with you and your colleagues when we were producing Kajaki that, you know, given your life experiences, given your problem solving ability, you know, A, the competencies around just who you are and how you operate are really good for the screen industries compared to military because, you know, you do pull together, you work towards a common goal, you understand hierarchy, you're never shy of a long day's work. Quite often you're used to working remotely alone and collaboratively as a team. So there's lots of sort of competencies that are very similar to the film industry. But then there's also some of the real sort of skill-based stuff. So for example, if you can keep an armoured vehicle running in the desert, you can service a camera dolly, you can service a camera tray, crane and stuff. So the first initiative that we set up working with Help for Heroes um, was around introducing 
um, veterans to the world of the GRIP department. And the GRIP department, when you see that come up in, in the credits, basically the GRIP department are responsible for everything from underneath the camera to the floor or whatever it's on. So if, for example, you're doing a shot and the camera's mounted on the bonnet of the car, the GRIP department would make sure that the connection between the camera and the car is solid enough that it's not going to fall off. You know, if you're doing some boat work, the GRIP department would be the connective tissue between the camera and the floor. And I just thought, you know, getting to see some of the engineering work that the military do and the technical work that the military do, that that was a, a good fit. So we did this thing called Grips for Heroes and we saw a cohort 12 um, and I was fortunate enough to go to Tedworth House and do a briefing there and go up to the Catterick Garrison and do a briefing there. And that worked really well. And then subsequently we've run something for location managers. So the locations department uh, it's like the logistics core. You know, they are the ones that move the unit. So first in, last out, establishing where all the vehicles go, making sure that everything's sort of managed in and managed out, making sure that the unit base is functional when it when it's there. And, you know, people that come from a military background are very good at that unit management stroke locations type work. That's been re a really effective point of crossover. In fact, we've we've recently been featuring in our new cinema campaign an ex Royal Marine who's gone into being a unit manager and um, we may be able to play that clip a bit later. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there, there are lots of po similar points of association between the, the two lifestyles. I think the, the biggest points of difference though is, you know, for me, filmmaking is sort of semi-organised chaos. I'm, uh, you know, I, I would hope the military runs a bit more smoothly than that, but you know, it may not be the case. But um, you know, I think one of the challenges we have about people transferring into the industry um, is that point of if they're coming in, having lived a life elsewhere, they've got life hours on the clock, and sometimes because they're coming in at an entry level, they're alongside a recent graduate or someone who's significantly younger. And I would always, you know, out of choice, be able to take. I'd much rather take someone that's got a lived experience and you know, know some of the challenges that life throws at them that, you know, they've had the corners knocked off a little bit, you know, nothing's worse than a sort of, you know, recent graduate that thinks that they should be in your job and they haven't got time on the clock, you know. Um, yeah, that's what, yeah. I mean, when, you know, prior to working with you, um, what, eight years ago now, and then my, this, this, the extra work I did last year, my understanding of the TV, well, not my understanding, my sort of naive thinking, like probably most other people, is, you know, going to TV and film, and the first thing you think of is the on-screen, mm. that kind of stuff. But then, having experienced those couple of productions I've worked with, it does open your eyes. It, did, it has very much opened my eyes, especially the recent one, and, and the, just the variety, the variety of jobs and roles and different things are there. And also, I, I, you remember, when you were talking about the grip department, it reminded me of the grip department from, the, from, um, mm -hmm. uh, from last year. And, and they, they remind me of, they remind me of my dad, actually, because mm -hmm. my dad was a, he was a gaffer in the theatre, yeah. the crew in the theatre, and it reminded me of the same kind of, like, the, the problem, Fix it. They always have a roll of gaffer tape there. They always have, you know, the yeah. zip tied in the arse, and, and they always present it with near impossible, near impossible asks. Like, yeah. right, we need a camera in this looking cranny, yeah. and uh, how we going? Oh, and by the way, the vehicle's moving, and X, Y, and Z, and we yeah. can't, you can't do it this way, and blah, blah, blah. And then the like the costume department, they reminded me exactly of my, um, oh my god, mother, mm. who's a costume designer, or was a costume designer in theatre again, actually. Yeah. And, uh, and and it's that again is actually very similar to the military. Mm. Different departments, different roles, different units. The personalities of the people are yeah. extremely different, yeah. larger between the different um, cores. And but with a lot of interdependencies, you're all reliant on each other, and you you are the definition of the sum of all those parts. You know, because if it doesn't come together collectively, either things stop or they're not as good as they can be. I mean, the variety of roles is something that we're we're always trying to remind people about. I mean, I do a fair bit of schools outreach. And one of the favourite anecdotes I share when I go into a school is that, you know, on the King's speech, I hired 456 people. There was one director, there was four producers and one writer, and everyone else had proper jobs. And we then talk about those 450 proper jobs. We talk about makeup and hair. We talk about the art department, locations, assistant directors, you know, all the technical roles like camera, sound, lighting. You know, it's, a, it's such a, 
a varied mix of roles. And I think the other thing that I always try and encourage, particularly when I'm talking to a younger audience, is that there's this sort of commonly held belief that everyone that works in the film and TV industry has to be high energy and sort of very up and, you know, but there is so much other work where if you're not naturally gregarious and a big character, you know, actually working, for example, in VFX or animation where you're doing quiet, very considered work, often in isolation on your own, you know. So just as there are a million different characters of people, there are many, many jobs that can suit those different characters. Yeah, the, the kit side actually boggled my mind, mm. boggled my mind. The, 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 like the cameras I see, I've seen on set are not like the camera you see in the, the films of old. Yeah. yeah. They just, I mean, yeah, the kit equipment, very, very tech, very, you need to be very technical minded to manage it. I couldn't understand it all yeah. together. I mean, it, in all of it. It's, uh, and it's high cost kit. You, you know, you're you're handling stuff that is you know very very valuable. And if and if it breaks or goes down on the day, likely to cause serious delay in in production. I mean, you know, the top end digital movie cameras now. You're probably talking knocking on by the time you've got the lenses and all the running gear on them, probably nearly half a million pounds. You know, and you're putting that half a million pounds on the boot of a car, or dropping it off a building, or sticking it on the side of a helicopter. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, so how yeah. is so? Let's talk more about screen skills if we can, yeah. because one of the you know one of the reasons this came about, uh, I asked you to to come onto the onto the podcast is because over the last few years I've seen a small amount of ex-military decide they're going to go into the industry in various things. Most of them have been on screen or on on you know in front of the camera, to to be honest, and a few uh, behind the camera, bags him as, as the prime example, right? But they've all. The ones I've seen, they've all been successful. They're bit, they're, you know, they've got a career there, a successful second career after the military, which in itself is difficult to do, I think, for many people. And they've all been successful. And it makes me wonder, can, you know, if there were more, if more people saw it as an opportunity and tried to go into the TV and film industry, would it be sort of the same high percentage would be successful with it? So, and screen skills, right, is one of the, you know, that's one of the things you're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, we, we basically, as an organisation, are there to help enable those that want to come into the industry and then hopefully support them to a full life career. And those that want to come into the industry isn't limited to graduates, isn't limited to per people of a certain age or certain background. In fact, you know, one of the big things that we're trying to achieve in our sector at the moment is to open up the opportunity so people from a variety of backgrounds and heritages can seriously consider coming into the screen sector because we need, not only do we need people power, we need more people to do more of the work that is evidently there, but also we want to try and get a richer mix of those that are doing the work, you know, people that have maybe lived a different life that haven't just come through, you know, a very academic pathway, um, people that we've talked about problem solving and, and stuff like that. Um, so I think, you know, there are opportunities to, to transfer in, I think, recognising the fact that you know, there are points of difference between, you know, a veteran's former life and potential future working life in, in screen is a bit different. And there, there is a bit of an attitude shift that, that takes place there. But I think the reason you're probably witnessing um, the joy that people have found by finding a career in the screen industries is that, you know, it, it tends to attract very similar people, you know, like we've talked about the problem solving, we've talked about the nature of people wanting to be part of a broader team. Um, you know, it's also, it's an industry that y you have to be a bit of a people person, you know, if you have to put, enjoy being around people in certain departments. Um, but it's very satisfying work, you know, if you complete the day's filming and you know the material you've recorded is of high quality, you know, you always get a little smile on your face, you know, if one of the actors sort of congratulates you on the work that you've done that day. Um, we do tend to be, as an industry, tend to be quite supportive of each other. I know that there's a bit of a, a history of bullying and harassment in our industry. And I think the sets that I grew up on 30 years ago were very different to the, the ones they are now. I think they are a more polite working environment. I think they might be high energy and high pace, but, you know, there's less cruelty, or as far as I've witnessed, there's, there's less sort of cruel actions on set, less bullying and less harassment. I'm not saying it doesn't take place, but, you know, and there's that sort of, that, that camaraderie of a, 
despite challenges, a good day's work done is, you know, is, is something that's quite, you know, quite um, in, uh, uplifting, you know, and most days are very, very different. Even, even going back to your dear old mum's Coronation Street, you know, every scene will be different. Every day's shooting will be different. It may be the same characters. It may be the same cobbled streets, but, you know, every day is very, very different. So I think that's something that people genuinely enjoy um, in terms of our industry. Uh, and yeah, I think that's, so I recently had a guy on called Mick Cartwright who's just getting into, just getting into the industry now, as always has been for the last couple of years, very much early on. And he's doing a, a bunch of different things. He's doing a lot of extra work on as much, as many different productions as he can, just to get an understanding of it. But before, I mean, talking about the kind of person you have to be to go into it. See, one of the reasons he, he's started enjoying it is because before he started it, well, the, the appeal of it, I think was that. What was required was obvious. It was the, the mission in inverted commas was clear each day. He knew what was needed to be, what was required, what was delivered. And he knew, quite obviously, if he delivered that at the end of the day, we got the scene done, got the production done today, cool, stop. And that was like immediately rewarded. I knew what I needed to do and I did what I needed to do. But one of the things that also helped him with was he was really struggling with uh, socialising with people or even get out, getting out of the house. Like he was having mental health issues. Okay. And, I, and it's really turning him round. Yeah. And, the, but then, and then on, the, on the flip side to Stephen Blades, who we were talking about earlier on, he, he was at the same, he was having problems. And uh, as in, when I say mental health issues, I'm not saying, in, well, maybe they were really serious, but they were quite common things that a lot of people experience who undergo a, a career change yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah. wasn't happy, couldn't find something else to do, yeah. you know, classic for a lot of the ex-military, but it's just yeah. not, not just reserved to the ex-military. Yeah. Um, so the way, so what I want to come on to is the way Mick is doing it and the way I think Stephen Blaze was, was doing it, or he's doing it, because no, Stephen's successful in his own right, was as much extra work as they can. And I think uh, to just to- Immerse put, themselves. Immerse themselves. Now, in my naivety, if I was going to go into the industry, that's, how, that's the only way I could think to do it. Okay, let's just, get myself on a database somewhere and get myself on productions as much as I can just to maybe find what I'm going to do and get a, get a big role and get a speaking mm -hmm. part and all, you know, all of yeah. that stuff. What, what would What's you suggest? Advice? What's the way forward? I don't yeah. know. I'm a person, military or not, yeah. looking for a new career and I want to get into the TV and film industry. I yeah. don't know what I want to do. I know that's what I try and do because it looks interesting. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's interesting. It's, it's not an overly complex picture. I think one of the key decisions that you need to try and arrive at is, is the performance side of things more interesting to you than the working behind the camera side of things. Because if you are going on to a set uh, at, in a performance role, whether that be as an extra or, 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 sorry, we don't call them extras anymore, a crowd or, you know, any of that. Supporting artists. Supporting artists, yeah. Thank you. I, was gonna, um, I got, I got well, offended then. Well, correct, well corrected. <laughs> Um, or crowd artists, you know, the thing is that you're, you're there to deliver a job on the day and, you know, it's great that you're interested and intrigued by everything else that's going on, but the truth is, you know, a production will hire you to deliver a service and on the day we need you to really be doing that and focused on doing that really, really well. Now, that's not saying chatting to people in the dinner queue or over a coffee or whatever um, is to be frowned on. It's not. It's, got, it's one of the lovely things about film sets is that they tend to be quite open and communicative. Um, but I think, you know, trying to rationalise whether you're thinking it's more a performance role or it's a craft or technical role is, is quite important. If you are thinking of being front of camera, you're absolutely right. One of the easier ways is to sign up with a supporting artist agency. They will have entry or eligibility criteria that they're looking for. Um, you know, you'll need basic things like the right to work in the UK. You, you know, quite often, out of preference, they want people that drive because getting to locations and back from locations is tricky if you're reliant on public transport. Um, you will be predominantly cast on how you look. That is just because if you're a if you're a supporting artist and we're populating a bar scene, you need to look like you're part of the clientele in that in that bar. So I think you have to be understanding of that, you know. Um, when it comes to actually sort of getting that break to maybe get lines of dialogue or actually a speaking role, the one thing I'd encourage is, if possible, do do some sort of form of training. Um, there is 
it's a mate. I'll tell a little story about a friend of mine who was this very gregarious character. He was a DJ. He was a mate of mine, and I was working on a TV show. And he was he's Char Charlie Large in the group. You know, he's always the one that's holding court, telling the jokes and stuff. And the director loved how this was playing out when she saw how we were between takes. And so she suddenly gave my friend, whose name will remain uh, <laughs> secret, this one line of dialogue. And it was a car crash. You know, he went from being able to be very confident around us as friends to having a big camera lens in his face. And he only had to get one line right. And it was not good. It was not good to witness. And so some limited training in how to be an actor, I think, is really helpful. And you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of pounds on it. There are even just some experience in amateur dramatics are, are helpful because it is a craft. Performance is a craft. And one My of the... daughters have that experience. My right. daughters have experience in amateur dramatics. Yeah. Every evening, every morning for school. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that they'll be learning <laughs> is understanding sort of, you know, recall and retention. So one of the most difficult things an actor has to do is actually remember and learn their lines. Now, that's fine if you've only got half a line and you need to know when you say it and who you follow. But if you've got pages of dialogue and you're having to deliver a performance against that. So like, you know, like any skilled tradesperson would do, you wouldn't expect to go to B&Q and pick up a chop saw and call yourself a carpenter in the same way, just giving yourself some skills around performance if you're intrigued in the acting side of things. Obviously, one thing that military do have way over and above everyone else um, is the sort of work that Bag starts, you know, that sort of, you know, bringing together groups of people, making them look authentic, you know, someone who's seen military service will hold themselves in a certain way, you know, they'll be in a scene in a certain way if they're part of a squad or a patrol, that all starts to look, look really quite, quite authentic and natural. So that's the performance side of things. If you're thinking about the, the sort of behind the camera stuff, you know, lean into organisations like Screen Skills, do your homework. We've got innumerate job profiles and careers maps. We've got a community of 160,000 users now where you can host your CV and your, your experiences. You know, um, there are all sorts of e-learning that we do that we host on the website so you can start to get well practised in certain areas. Um, and, I, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you to sort of attend the events that we put on. I, I'd shared with you that we've just had a two day, you know, a two day weekend down at Pinewood Studios where Pinewood were great. They threw open their doors for two days. We invited all manner of people in, both school children, graduates and people that were thinking about transferring into, into, our, organize, uh, into our industry. So keeping an eye out for all of those opportunities and they're becoming more prevalent as, as the industry recognises it needs to bring more people in. It is slowly opening its doors more readily to, to sort of creating opportunity where people can see what we what we do. I mean, we had a really interesting piece just post pandemic. We did a piece of work with the Department of Works and Pensions because, um, as you may know, Pinewood's very near Heathrow Airport. And post pandemic, it looked like there was going to be something like four and a half thousand redundancies at Heathrow because it was going to take time for international tourism to recover. And so DWP approached us and said, you know, could you do some sessions where you look at the transferable skills from someone that may have been in sort of client services for for an airline? What what could they come across into someone that was into logistics and freight management, you know, what could they transfer over to, you know, someone that had maybe been on the engineering side and maintenance, what could they transfer into? And we built a little cohort of basically ex-airline employees that were exposed to, to working in our, in our industry. So yeah, there, there's, there's often schemes and initiatives that are running. It's just about keeping aware of them, you know, sign up for our newsletters, always a good, good starting point. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. It's exposure to information, isn't it? And then, um, it's a, well, how do people sign up for your newsletter? So on screen skills, you can set up a profile. Yeah. That profile, once you've created it once, ca it carries with you. So if you then come to us to do a piece of training or you apply for a bursary <coughs> or apply for a mentor or any of those things, you know, once we've got that account, we can help also promote to you the things that we're doing. And we're in the sign up process, you basically state which bits you're interested in hearing about from us. So we have a core newsletter that goes out once a month. We have sector specific newsletters that go out once a month and you can elect which ones of these you want to want to receive. 
Screen Skills with a Z? Uh, no, oh gosh, no, no. Screen, no. It was, <laughs> no, it was discussed at one point that we were going to try and be down with the kids, um, but no, we uh, we decided against that. No, oh, so sorry. Screen Skills is screenskills.com, S C R E E N S K I L L S dot com, um, and yeah, you can set up an account and profile, and that thing gives you access to all the all the wonderful resources that we have available. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, from I mean, from my perspective, like people listening, I, they were, I've one is through you, so people's, you know, if, you, if you're interested in the industry, then speak to people you know who have been involved in the industry and I'm happy to reach out to me and, and other people, or anyone else you know. And then yeah, there are organisations as well that are not just you, like yourself, yeah. military friendly, but they're actually run by military as well. So like yeah. certain, you mentioned, uh, Bags mentioned services to film. Services to film. Dickie Tran, you know, Dickie, 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 Dickie Tran's coming on the yeah. podcast as well. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, he's great fan. When he comes yeah. in, I'm going to put the heating on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, getting a few. Um, but also on, bare arms and the bare work arms they do. Or bags I mean, they, on twice, you know, yeah. these are things where um, anything that's in and around sort of handling um, armaments. You know, one of the things that I know has been a really good route into the industry is medics. So people that have got higher level medical training through their military life. You know. On every feature film, we typically will have a paramedic on set every day, and there are organisations that that specialise in delivering those services. Um, caterers as well. You know, there's a couple of people I know that have come out of the military having run canteens for, for the military that are now on the food trucks for, for for us. So, just in the same way, there's there's lots of lift, lots of different facets of military work. You know, there's probably an equal and equivalent version in our world that is closely aligned yeah i really do think there's a role there for everyone it's like you, i think you mentioned it, we did mention at the start of the podcast is that is that the the lifestyle or the work style if you like is very different to many uh, to other industries but it might just be what you're after yeah like that organized chaos is, is one way to describe it yeah. or complex really organized complex work would be a, like a a, a a nicer way to describe it because it is absolutely organized and, and definitely definitely still in my uh i can say it's not a career of mine that stuff i've done it does seem super chaotic but mm. at the end of the production mm. it's all come together yeah I go, oh my god people are making that happen how did that happen and, and, and I think 99.9% of the time it comes down to great people, great communication, the great plan. Yeah, and a lot of perseverance and stuff. Yeah. What have we covered that you didn't want to, that you, what haven't we covered that you did want to cover? <laughs> no, I think, we covered I think it. we've had a really good, really good open and, and frank chat. I mean, what I would say is if any of the audience is, is listening and has an interest, um, you know, do visit the website, but also reach out to you. I'm more than happy for you to connect people into me so that we can have a, an ongoing discussion about it. Um, because yeah, we, we we are super busy in the screen industries in the UK, and always on the lookout for for new talent. And new talent comes in a variety of guises and from lots of different sources. So we remain open to try and welcome people into our industry. Amazing, been a pleasure. Thank cool. you. Lovely, Hugh. Good to see you. Cheers, <laughs> That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. 
In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my Patreon supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go on and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my Patreon supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events, so you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.